Thank you all for joining us today at the San Francisco State University Poetry Center and Archives for this remote reading and conversation between two singular thinkers and writers, Mamtaza Mary and Zoe Samudzi, which is being co-sponsored by the Tripwire Cross-Cultural Poetic Series. My name is Alex Cruz, and I will be your MC today. 
At this time, we would like to acknowledge that the campuses of San Francisco State University on the San Francisco Peninsula and North Bay are located within the occupied territories of the Ohlone peoples and the coastal Miwok. Though a mere acknowledgement is not adequate to address generations of expropriation and genocide, we humbly thank and pay our respects to the past, present, and emerging custodians of these lands. Uh, we very much look forward to your questions following Zoe's and Momtaza's readings, uh, but please send these using Zoom's uh, Q&A feature rather than the chat. Um, I would also like to announce that next Saturday, March 20th at 12 o'clock noon uh, Pacific time, the Poetry Center will be hosting a reading and conversation between poets Denise Riley and Jennifer Soong with Brandon Brown as MC. Uh, so uh, now to discuss Tripwire Journal and the poetry series, I would like to invite David Book on screen. Thank you. Hello. Sorry, just getting getting turned on. Hello, everyone. I'm in um, also in uh, unceded Ohlone territory, aka Oakland, on this side of the bay. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks Alex and um, thanks Steve and all the um, Poetry Center staff. Um, all power to the workers and students who, who's presumably underpaid and underrecognized labor uh, keeps these kinds of uh, projects afloat and thriving. Um, I just wanna say a few words about this series. This is the third year that um, Poetry Center has graciously um, hosted and helped organize the um, uh, cross-cultural poetic series. Um, and it's been a really great opportunity to bring uh, interesting people together who are thinking dynamically and uh, creatively about um, what, I mean, even cross-cultural poetic seems um, like a somewhat dated, um, um, concept since as we know um, capitalism is very uh, efficient at um, diversity and multiculturalism practices um, being um, somewhat drained of their potential radicalism in the interests of um, multinational consumerism but the writers we have today are um, I think a great example of something that's more I guess certain of the left in the last century might have called a, a, a internationalism, which is really about building sort of um, interesting kinds of connections and solidarities and, and sort of constellatory thinking uh, across um, borders and languages, milieus. And also just um, uh, Zoe Montuz, I think represent um, also not just sort of poets writing in, in their own and different traditions, but also working as activists, performers, um, um, scholars, uh, cultural critics, and um, thus across a variety of, of audiences and communities. And um, not sure if that means we could say cross subcultural poetics, but I do think that there is something that animates uh, the writing when it's in a wider um, conversation with communities with very different positionalities and um, political in investments in um, what we might call radical literature. Anyways, that's my little spiel. You can learn more about this series at, um, I'll put in the, what you call it, uh, at Tripwire Journal, there is uh, the pamphlet series, uh, which are all as uh, $3 or free PDFs. Um, which includes uh, pamphlets from uh, Antenna Ayer and the Cartanera Collective, who were the um, participants in the previous two um, events like this at uh, the Poetry Center, as well as uh, you can donate. Here's my one donate pitch. Donate to the um, microgrants and translation as Tripwire pays uh, translators for... Um, uh, new translations, um, and it's just an opportunity to uh, pitch into that sort of, um, it is a micro, but it is a, it is a micro grant. So there is <laughs> just to support translators who I think um, are increasingly important for how we um, get rid of borders. And that's it. Enjoy. Thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you, David. 
Uh, so uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mamtaza Mary first, and uh, her bio is uh, Mamtaza Mary is a poet and independent researcher. Her work has been widely anthologized and has appeared in Granta, Art Forum, The Guardian, Bomb, and Real Life Mag. She is the former Young People's Laureate for London. Her latest pamphlet, Doing the Most with the Least, was published in 2019 by Goldsmiths Press. Her Sugar Lump Prayer was included in the chapbook box set New Generation African Poets, edited by Kwame Dawes and Chris Abani, um, the African Poetry Book Fund, um, Akashic Books, 2017. So without further ado, thank you, Mamtaza. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here reading with Zoe. I'm super excited about this. Um, so I decided that for today, I would just read um, super recent work that's really part of this ongoing project um, of mine. And to just, yeah, try and share some of that with you and um, really, yeah, just be in conversation with Zoe around some of the themes that um, seem to be revealed in our work. Um, but also anything beyond that. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation as well. Um, this, this project I've been working on for a while now is part of a, um, a wider sort of, of this fluid text that's around the miasma of nostalgia and nationalism as a lens uh, through which to understand or reckon with family and the familial. Um, it's been, well, it's actually been one of the hardest projects I've ever worked on because not only because it's deeply personal with a capital P, but also because it requires an interrogation of my own delusions, um, a kind of uh, disputing of the, uh, of the common speech of disaster, to paraphrase Baraka. But I think it's also because it's, it reminds me actually of this, old, this Dean Blunt interview that I was reading the other day, where he speaks about music as a way for him to purge everything that he's absorbed. And I don't really, believe in that whole well actually this is very personal but for me I don't believe in that whole writing is catharsis kind of thing that kind of vibe but to me this project really feels like I'm sort of secreting in a way everything that I'm sort of about everything that I've sort of absorbed um unwillingly um so I've been thinking a lot of that idea of leakage in my own work um and in relation to everything that I've been reckoning with but also I just want to speak to the essence of this text and then fling it out and then disappear. So that's the goal. Um, so the project has kind of undergone various different reorientations, which have been like physically torturous. Um, so I'm just going to read from it and just read excerpts from the text and hopefully do it justice and um, yeah, maybe even do this very dramatic intro some justice as well. Um, so yeah, I'll just read some excerpts from it, and hopefully I won't go over my time. The plural possible. I hear you talking about we a lot. Oh, you speak French now. That's an epigraph from the legendary party next door. Past the Greek Orthodox Church, we linger down streets named after martyrs. The smell of fried potatoes clings to the skin of nostrils. Ahead, Avenue de Ghana. Unmoored in the land of Moors, Google Maps is thankfully useless. Old Medina swallows us whole. Detours to follow, detours to abandon. Unforgiving stretches of alleyways and dead ends. A being together that welcomes the uncertainty of a false step. If there's no definable entrance or exit, you can't get lost. Loss loses meaning. Track your way in tea houses. Hissing oil vies with Miriam Makeba's daughter asking us if we remember Malcolm, if we remember what it meant to wake up black and alive and free in Algiers. The long 20th century rattles like a loose tooth in the mouth. Let us skirt the puddles of its failures. Crisp apple and mint, pass the pipe clockwise. So much of it all depends on how, not what we remember. Hooded men sweep doorsteps, the Sahel remains securitized. Dispossession has to be more than an icebreaker, kinship more than the kindling of decolonial lullabies. We are trying to be responsible with our pain. The coast will not let us forget it. A cab ride away, time belongs to plastic debris and giggling schoolgirls. 
some burn expats turn suburbs into playgrounds. We approach where Fanon once shared bread with howling fighters. Like all children of Manichaean nightmares, he worked but barely slept. At the clinic near me, they called him the Black Doctor. There were other names, some less polite, all closer to some kind of truth. What are a few words between bloodied brothers? The blood of the Maghrib is sufficiently generous, quote, unquote. Massacred villages jostle for space in his footnotes. Some of us will spend a lifetime competing for the acknowledgement of wounds. We are together for better and for worse, quote, unquote. Fanon's cavernous we, the we of the Algerian, the Martinican, the exiled South African mother singing, the Sahrawi guerrilla, the Somali teenager in the Libyan prison camp. Fanon's we had the capacity to contain them. His colleagues believed in a we too shrunken for reciprocity. Politics is the passing of the we, the maintenance of its enclosure, the engulfment of all who attempt to escape its confines. This is territory as terror. The plural personal is the evidence of murderous affinity. It is always an absence. Who is betrayed by every assumed we? Later, we trade bad jokes and olives on the roof. The children of rural southerners and seasoned hustlers recount revolutions, trigger happy snipers, fleeing despots and embittered survivors. Ours is a revolving cast of characters. The fortunate ones can afford to exchange one banilu for another. Distant cousins are both blueprints and harbingers. Desire is bi-directional. The vantage point makes all the difference. Africa becomes a repository of unceasing fantasies, the sublimation of our curdled angst. It does not move, not until we move over it or back to it. Self-deception is an occupational hazard of returnee life. Here, the soda is a radioactive orange. After dark, we will grill chicken and discuss the lapsarian nature of grief. We are trying to disentangle the we, to test its dimensions, to scuff our shoes against its brittle edges. This will feel like a kind of death, a death on the job site, a death at the movies. People like us are dying anyway, people like us but not us. Daily the distinction collapses even as it establishes itself. I don't want to guard something I don't own. One, disciples of prepaid calling cards and frothy gossip. I name you long after I leave you. Amal in a rehab, her cousin sent to sit October to the sprawling satellites of another false star. My body in blighty, my head always elsewhere. Yusra, she left. Maryam too. Nasra and Iman, gone. All specialists in the unromantic art of rootlessness. Egypt is like mandatory military service for East Africans. We let the laughter escape without ransom over the phone. Tahia Masr, we all got to do our time. Let this be the evidence of our painstakingly accumulated realness, realness as quantified by the lusciously contraband currency of struggle, whatever that means to whoever is asking. I love you like I love each and every one of my girls, my Halimos and Hayats and Hanans, brown-eyed, full-throated, helicopter-pad, pulmonic exhaust, slave name substitute, irritant hazard symboled, cryptic, decennial dolls. We are the vectors of our own beginnings. Neither former nor latter, we sing of the blood-borne dislocation, the night sweats, the tactile touch, the nevermore therefores, the heart's knock-kneed double dutch. Two, the holiest month is ushered in by IM chat sessions and notification alerts during that inching hour just before iftar. She moved to Cairo just in time for the revolution, like clockwork, there we go again. Blackness as centripetal force, as timekeeping beyond time, as magpie collation, as marunage, as a besieged midwife, as a matin, a wahala, a junoon, a reverie of blue vein jinns. Ya Allah, do not impose on us one who does not have mercy on us, one who does not fear you. The satellite beams marble and cubic zirconia and televised coverage of millions breaking their fasts, courtesy of the Saudi government run station the center holding again. Like when Maimuna's sister left for Damascus for medical school, only for the war to start, and she told everyone she didn't get this far just to leave without graduating 
and her Abba said he didn't give a shit if a bomb fell on her head, she was going to be a doctor. Otherwise, what was the point of trekking 10 days on his feet to reach the Kenyan border? We wished her what we could. Well. Two. British Pate owns me, owes me a cup. Reels of Habar's golden era belong only to those who can still taste the incidental nature of loss. Fiat Cinquecentos in pastel colors, thus kicked up by laughing women. How a taco statue with a characteristic long neck and sword. Nobody is sure who killed her. January 1948 saw the deployment of the Four Powers Commission, composed of the US, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, to Mogadishu. The objective was to determine the future of Italian colonies in the Horn. Protesting Somalis were gunned down. Tarko was one of them. We can't be sure who fired the fatal shot. Some say she was struck by a poisoned arrow by a Somali man fighting for the Italians. Either way, it was most likely a man. Post-independence, Tarko was inaugurated by the Somali Youth League as a national heroine. The motherland, stone and sword in hand, a baby on the banknotes. It's amazing how much exposition a 40 second clip can contain. Children hug their satchels, led by a teacher in spotless shoes. She points at the murals and traces an oversimplified linearity both in air and thought. Marx, Engels, Lenin, Siad, the generation born feet first. I am bored of hereditary cages. Do you hate what the country has done to you or do you hate what we have done to each other? I don't know what to tell you that I haven't told myself. The screen buffers, baited. You catch your reflection on the screen and watch yourself watching yourself. FOMO, fear of mutual outpouring. Convince yourself it belongs to you, that anything belongs to you. Find a flurry of footage to corroborate your arrogance. Call it research. Outside, outliers. 1975 marked the last official national census, a sleight of hand which depicted as much as it demarcated. Accelerating urbanization, muddied outliers, the flight within and between borders, the aggrieved aching stretch between the settled and the nomadic, the aggregated centers and the rippling dispersal, always out of sight, always afoot. The year of arrested growth and bitter desiccation was also the year of the family law and the land law, the nightmare of the polygamist and the desire of the capitalist, hearth and home and horror. We had it all until we didn't. The census was held during an abar, one of the grimmest droughts in the young country's history. Conductors trekked the northern highlands, the settlements edging the Jubba and Shabele rivers, the rural backwaters inhabited by a smattering of transient populations. In search of water and sustenance for their children and animals, the abar had propelled many into desperate motion, into another kind of scattering. Enumerators struggled against this heightened state of flux, trying to capture this errantry, to count the restless flock, to bestow the unwanted gift of legibility upon the people. They were not seeking clarity, only a refracted chink of purpose, the telos of nation, the polity of innocence. Movement was negation, a primitive hesitance to accept what the lettered and learned foisted upon one's own cosmology. Movement as the skepticism of the faithful, as practice refusal. We are African because we are always moving, being made to move, being moved on and over. In the years that followed, other censuses were conducted. Their findings never published. The 80s were a decade of entrenchment, the clan a body of myth and mystification that ballooned swelling with its own contradictions. Its limbs atrophied, but still, we carried it over our shoulders, passed the effigy on like dutiful non-citizens. During that time, conductors were suspected to have exaggerated the size of their own clans. Some say government officials were shocked to discover the true numbers of minoritized groups and the disquieting possibility that their powerful clans were, in fact, statistical minorities. Legitimacy is disputed. Our current state is its refutation. There is no way to determine which tribal affiliations, ethno-nationalisms, linguistic patterns or territorial claims constitute an incontestable majority. 
the fraught political system hinges on the representation of all major clans on a patch of land where everyone thinks they are the majority. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't, until they do. The ripping up of land tenure and enshrinement of dispossession was also the year of the rural literacy campaign. Take with one hand, teach with the other. My city bred father sent to the hinterlands with a duffel bag full of thumbed through textbooks. The soft implosions of his breathing as a teenage lion, a male, poured the thatch fronds of the hut he slept in. The nights were agonizingly long. The nomads laughed at these sons of Red Sea traders and policemen, so detached from their milk memoried origin stories. Possessors of weak stomachs and weaker dispositions, educated in the classrooms of former fascists, they had the audacity to be startled by the staccato of hyenas. 4.5, they formulated their monomania, portioned the system of recognition by way of home office, school gates, bus rides, supermarket doorways, bailiff and bystander, we come to know ourselves through their miscalculations. We misplace the house keys we stole, shudder with abasement, lose the meticulously cultivated distance we wrung in the basin of the Indian Ocean, a distance from the abyss of Africanity, a distance from what, we can, what can be confined but never repressed, pursued but never outrun. At night, we slept better. By day, the hyenas laughed. So I'm going to read two more excerpts. I think I've got time for that. I don't want to run over my time. Hoyas dragged up into other languages. Hoyas who didn't speak English, Swedish, German, Finnish, Dutch. Hoyas who could read in Arabic but couldn't understand bottle throwing Egyptian nor accented humiliation. Hoyas who didn't speak at all. Hoyas with no use for niceties. Hoyas with dreams of their own. Hoyas who debilitated us with the weight of their dreams. Hoyas who married high school sweethearts. Hoyas who married bus drivers. Hoyas who married unrepentant killers. Hoyas who sang for them. Hoyas who lent a soundtrack to slaughter. Hoyas by blood. Hoyas by loose association. Hoyas by archipelagos of clan. Hoyas by name. Hoyas by namelessness. Hoyas mothering, milk, memoried, maladjusted, marine mamas who stalk the hallways of our poems are gracious enough to pretend we are more than desperate ventriloquists, more than humane cannibals. Hoyas we did not ask, but you gave. What we asked for, you couldn't. So I'll read. I think I've got time actually for maybe, I'm good for time, I think I can do one more, yeah. So this one is actually the only one I've read so far that's from the pamphlet. So I guess it's not as recent as the rest, um, but it's very much in vain with the rest of the project. Okay. Fluke by any other name is a flight number. When they first came over, nobody knew what Finland was or where it was or what to even wear on the flight. You passed the medical examination and stood there glorious as a beggar, as the American doctor laughed and said, you're good to go. Seems like all the Muslim ones rarely have AIDS. Next thing you know, it's cold and they're in Tampere, home of the swollen bellied and coincidentally, on a crisp December mid-morning, much like the day of their arrival, Lenin first met Stalin at a Bolshevik conference, which is neither here nor there, but more pressingly is not where they would rather be, if given the choice, which is unlikely, considering the oceanic gulf between choice and options, between affection and affect. Put another way, on arrival, they still couldn't locate their new home on a map. Thin air could only do so much, despite regularly being ranked as one of the safest operating airlines with this last fatal accident occurring in 1963, the year of Diet Coke and Four Little Girls, and Malcolm's body in Michigan, his spirit in Bandung, in Nairobi, in Paris, in Saigon. Don't be shocked when I say I was in prison. You're still in prison. That's what this land means, prison. Oh, for such delicious clarity, the warm butter of his rage. A speech later sampled by public enemy, 
then recycled as part of the soundtrack to the video game Sonic Rush. A cobalt blue and white hedgehog, the same color of the Finnish flag, a force unable to catch up with itself. The perfect metaphor for the ache of a wrist held in anticipation for the conveyor belt to return their luggage, if not their country. Both will do, both they carry on their shoulders, but only one will weigh them down. So I just got a message from Steve in the chat. I think I have time for one more excerpt. So I'll just do this one and finish with this one. Later they said, he was one of the ringleaders, chased the market women into the masjid, army trucks ribboned the coast. The neighbors looked away, gave their children the gift of bigger bedrooms. They said he rested on the steps of the low building, wiped their tears from his knuckles. On rising, they said his legs gave out from under him, a flailing he could not explain, a reckoning they repeated across waters. They believed what they wanted to believe, that the soil never forgets, that even the beggars reach out with one hand, a tone with the other. A musallah choked with howls, a reddening sky, the bolted windows, the sanctity of coral stone, the tyranny of dirt grooves, the enclosure of state, of statelessness, the enclosure of family. They blamed themselves. They said they deserved this tyranny. They said they deserved divine judgment, swallowed their fevered adolescence, pretended to be other people. They cursed continuity with dry tongues, disavowed what they could not burn, waited until it was safe enough to look back. They are still waiting. Yeah, so thanks for letting me share that with you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mamtaza, for that really incredible reading. Um, I'm so delighted to talk more about it um, later on in our conversation. And now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Zoe Samudzi. Uh, Zoe Samudzi is a writer, photographer, and a doctoral candidate in medical sociology at the University of California, San Francisco. Her writing has appeared in The New Inquiry, Warscapes, Truth Out, Roar Magazine, Teen Vogue, BGD, Bitch Media, Open Space, and Verso, among others. With William C. Anderson, Zamudzi is co-author co of As Black as Resistance, Finding the Conditions for Liberation, which was printed by AK Press in 2018. All right, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, really excited to be here. Thank you so much, Mumtaza, for sharing your beautiful writing. Um, I am unfortunately not a poet, so I will be reading some poetry. Um, so yeah, I will start my reading. So I have four things. We'll read a fifth, time permitting. So the first one is um, Death Fugue by Paul Salen. Black milk of morning, we drink you evenings. We drink you at noon and mornings, we drink you at night. We drink and we drink. A man lives in a house, he plays with the snakes, he writes. He writes when it darkens to Deutschland, your golden hair, Marguerite. He writes and steps in front of his house and the stars glisten and he whistles his dogs to come. He whistles his Jews to appear, let a grave be dug in the earth. He commands us play up for the dance. 
Black milk of dawn, we drink you at night. We drink you mornings and noontime. We drink you evenings. We drink and we drink. A man lives in the house. He plays with the snakes. He writes. He writes when it turns dark to Deutschland, your golden hair, Marguerite. Your ashen hair, Shulamit. We dig a grave in the air. There one lies at ease. He calls jab deeper into the earth. You there and you other, men sing and play. He grabs the gun in his belt. He draws it, his eyes are blue. Jab deeper your spades. You there and you other men continue to play for the dance. Black milk of dawn, we drink you at night. We drink you at noon, we drink you evenings. We drink you and drink. A man lives in the house, your golden hair, Marguerite. Your ashen hair, Shulamit. He plays with the snakes. He calls out, play death more sweetly. Death is a master from Deutschland. He calls, scrape those fiddles more darkly. Then as smoke, you'll rise in the air. Then you'll have a grave in the clouds. There you'll lie at ease. Black milk of dawn, we drink you at night. We drink you at noon. Death is a master from Deutschland. We drink you evenings and mornings. We drink and drink. Death is a master from Deutschland. His eye is blue. He strikes you with lead bullets. His aim is true. A man lives in the house, your golden hair, Marguerite. He sets his dogs on us. He gifts us a grave in the air. He plays with the snakes and dreams. Death is a master from Deutschland. Your gold hair, Marguerite. Your ashen hair, Shulamit. Okay, and then my second one is Emptied Heart by um, Dambuzo Marichera from his, the collection of his poetry, Cemetery of Mind. Emptied Hearts. No drums underline my singing, neither ululation nor grunt raw incantatory. Even, when the, even the song is only what happens when emptied hearts are dredged from the watery lanterns. Tugged and fished into the gasping air, where arias concuss and truncheons educate, and books destroy the eyes, and machines through the flesh through flesh run amok, when emptied hearts are dredged from watery lanterns. Agreed and smile to death by, by pale earnest virgins, who in bed tear and claw with voracious appetite. I thought all Negroes were big. Shrink cheated perplexed, and I watched Londong recede from the red screen of closed eyelids. My heart, my emptied heart dredged from the watery lanterns. Yes, no drums, but snug pear-shaped buttocks that tease and squirm when red hot embers strike deeply from Zambia, Mozambique, Botswana, strike deeply. This screwed up bitching tract of emptied hearts with water dredged from the watery lanterns with nothing to lose but their precious void of self. On the go, the bludged footprints of this and that on the go, the froth spittle of killing time on the go, ambulances, protractors, steaming cunts on the go, with nothing to lose but the precious void of self. The sun against the wall pierces cold virgins, tomorrow's hags, their lives, a nightmare of moon and nine months, letters unanswered delivered of babies, with nothing to lose but the precious void of self. Sisters on the go, bleeding, from, brother, from brother's sudden backhander, Mother's throng of insulting dismay on the go morally. Seductions result, unwanted hollers, tiny fists against my razor, with nothing to lose but the precious void of self. Put out the fire and to ash, reduce all passion, that's shit. Werther, out on a limb, it was not the sun, but a pun on heat that stroked our eve. With a baby in one hand and in the other a come hither, she sits astride the land's fork, Smudges with lipstick the clouds, drowns with the little cries the ardent flame. My dreams are derelict, derelict lives of honey and sting plundered, such days as stagger across few, such nights as leap across the gutters and drains, such exhaustion as fills the space memory relinquishes, are the excretions abrupt to the wayside. The word's dark stain has touched the deepest pain, and there on a leaf the poem's chrysalis trembles. I ease the penis into place and motionlessly race towards the world's rim with nothing to lose but the precious void of self. Morning leans on a sunbeam, pipes her shrill melody with a gleam till walking more than dreaming in chance, I bundle the stained sheets into the bin 
The day's pleasing promise soon turns sour, the honey and sting plundered by rain and doubt. I dream a terror dreamless, a darkness shadowless, lightning flared with slow and stealing attack. And voracious sick sees the red-lipped wooing bitch with bursting greed drive against her forceful vitals, galloping deeper and deeper till my testicles explode, wiping the void with the deafening back of hand. Okay, the next piece is a um, um, small excerpt from Elaine Scarry's incredible um, The Body in Pain. Um, let's see. As in dying and death, so in serious pain, the claims of the body utterly nullify the claims of the world. The annihilating power of pain is visible in the simple fact of experience observed by Karl Marx. There's only one antidote to mental suffering and that is physical pain. A pronouncement whose premises are only slightly distorted in Oscar Wilde's God spare me physical pain and I'll take care of the moral pain myself as though in anticipation of a century that would produce out of its own physical well-being an endless fascination with the details of psychic distress and dislocation. The 19th century periodically reminded itself and its heirs of the privileges implicit in madness. Whether that reminder took the form of aphorism as in Marx and Wilde, or was expanded into narrative as in George Eliot's Arthur Donathorne, who notices petulantly that physical pain might lift him out of his own self-absorbed boredom long enough to help him avoid damaging himself, a very young woman, and the hierarchical norms of their community. Physical pain is able to obliterate psychological pain because it obliterates all psychological content, painful, pleasurable, and neutral. Our recognition of its power to end madness is one of the ways in which knowingly or unknowingly we acknowledge its power to end all aspects of self and of world. Another manifestation of this power is its continual reappearance in religious experience. The self-flagellation of the religious ascetic, for example, is not, as is often asserted, an act of denying the body, eliminating its claims from attention, but a way of so emphasizing the body that the contents of the world are canceled and the path is clear for the entry of an unworldly, contentless force. It is in part this world ridding path clearing logic that explains the obsessive presence of pain in the, in the rituals of large, widely shared religions, as well as in the imagery of intensely private visions. That partly explains why forms, um, excuse me, why the crucifixion of Christ is at the center of Christianity why so many primitive forms of worship climax in pain ceremonies, why Bronte's Wuthering Heights is built on the principle first announced in Lockwood's dream that the pilgrim staff is also a cudgel, why even Hoisman's famous dandy recognizes in his sieges of great pain a susceptibility to religious conversion, why in the brilliant ravings of Artaud some ultimate and essential principle of reality can be compelled down from the heavens onto a theater stage by the mind of cruelty. Why, though it occurs in, in widely different contexts and cultures, the metaphysical ins, is insistently coupled with the physical, with the equally insistent exclusion of the middle term world. The position of the person who is tortured is in, is in many ways, of course, radically different from the person who experiences pain in a religious context, or that of an old person facing death, or that of a person hurt in a dentist's office. One simple and essential difference is duration. Although a dentist's drill may in fact be the torturous instrument, it will not land on a nerve for the eternity of a few seconds, but for the eternity of the uncountable number of seconds that make up the period of torture. A period that may be 17 hours on a single day, or four hours a day on each of 29 days. A second difference is control. A person tortured does not will his entry into and withdrawal out of the pain as the religious communicant enters and leaves the pain of a Good Friday meditation, or as the patient enters and leaves the pain of a healing therapy. A third difference is purpose. The path of worldly objects is swept clean, not as in religion to make room for the approach of some divinely intuited force, nor as in medicine or dentistry to repair the ground for the return of the world itself. There is in torture not even a fragment of a benign explanation as there is in old age where the absence of the world from oneself can be understood as an inexperienceable inversion of the eventual 
but inexperienceable absence of oneself from the world. Perhaps only in the prolonged and searing pain caused by accident or by disease or by the breakdown of the pain pathway itself is there the same brutal senselessness as in torture. But these other non-political contexts are called upon because they make immediately self-evident a central fact about pain that although emphatically present in torture is also obscured there by the idiom of betrayal. It is the intense pain that destroys a person's self and world, a destruction experienced spatially as either the contraction of the universe down to the immediate vicinity of the body or as the body swelling to fill the entire universe. Intense pain is also language destroying as the content of one's world disintegrates, so the content of one's language disintegrates. And as the self disintegrates, so that which would express and project the self is robbed of its source and its subject. World, self, and voice are lost or nearly lost through the intense pain of torture and not through the confession as is wrongly suggested by its connotations of betrayal. The prisoner's confession merely objectifies the fact of their being almost lost, makes their invisible absence or nearby absence visible to torturers. Torture then, to return for a moment to the starting point consists of a primary physical act, the infliction of pain, a primary verbal act, the interrogation. The verbal act consists of two parts, the question and the answer, each with conventional connotations that wholly falsify. The first mistake credits the torturer providing him with the justification, his cruelty and explanation. The second discredits the prisoner, making him rather than the torturer, his voice rather than his pain, the cause of his loss of self and world. These two misinterpretations are obviously neither accidental nor unrelated. The one is an absolution of responsibility, the other is a conferring of responsibility. The two together turn the moral reality of torture upside down. Almost anyone looking at the physical act of torture would be immediately appalled and repulsed by the torturers. It is difficult to think of a human situation in which the lines of moral responsibility are more starkly or simply drawn, in which there is a more compelling reason to ally one's sympathies with one person and repel the claims of another. Okay, my next piece um, I'm reading are the poems Lazarus by um, Lucille Clifton. So there are three um, short, short Lazarus poems. Lazarus, first day. I rose from stiffening into a pin of light and a voice calling Lazarus this way. And I floated or rather swam in a river of sound toward what seemed to be forever. I was almost, almost there when I heard behind me Lazarus come, Lazarus come forth. And I found myself twisting in this light for this is the miracle, Mary Martha. At my head and at my feet, singing my name was the same voice. Second day. I am not the same man born into the crypt. As one's return from other where, altered by what they've seen, so have I been forever, Lazarus. Lazarus who was dead. What entered the light was one man, what walked out is another. And the final, third day. On the third day, I contemplate what I was moving from, what I was moving toward, light again, and I could hear the seeds turning in the grass. Mary Martha, I could feel the world. Now I sit here in a crevice on this rock, stared at answering questions. Sisters stand away from the door to my grave, the only truth I know. And I have time for the very last one, so I'm glad I managed to time this well. So it's called um, Limpopo Blues by Tsitsi Ella Jaji. I am not swimming across this river. I am reading a headline in the free newspaper on the plain. 17 Zimbabweans die, drown in the Limpopo River. I do not call my cousin brothers in Cape Town when I touch down in Josie for the conference in case they want bus fare to come visit me or sound flat when I mention my book or notice that I ask about their little one by not, but not by name. What a crock, this river between Rand and Dollar and neither one ours. This river has double crossed us. So thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Zoe. That was really, really brilliant. Um, yeah, and for anybody who wishes to revisit those texts again, uh, Steve has placed citations in the chat. Um, yeah, really beautiful work. Um, so now we're going to kind of shift into the conversation portion of the event. And audience members, you're welcome to continue using the Q&A feature or if you wish to ask your question aloud, uh, just please use the raise hand icon, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, and I was thinking, because we're also fortunate to have both of you here in dialogue, that um, we could maybe just begin with any questions you may have for each other, if that's all right with you both. Great. Oh. Yeah, I'm good with that. Cool. Any questions, Zoe? Boy, I'm just... I wrote down some lines. I was trying to like keep pace and see if there's anything specifically that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, I loved the census one, especially, and there's a line where you said, um, I think this is what you said, that the census bestowed the unwanted gift of legibility. Um, legibility to what? To whom? Right. I mean, in terms of the actual sort of the census uh, taking process um, in 1975, it was very much this idea of legibility within the framework of uh, major clan and minor clan um, and also the various different ethnic uh, so minoritized ethnic groups within Somalia, but also in general, just legibility as this sort of confine that we're still we're still trying to grapple with. And in many ways, it it. It is again. It's about. It was styled upon, in many ways, um, and you have to sort of figure out where you fit within it. But also, it's very much ties into the the fracture of the country and everything that's that's actually going on right now in terms of how you it's morphed into the contemporary four point five political system in Somalia, which is again four point five to represent the four major clans and the point five is really everybody else um and again it's that refusal to it's, it's, it's that refusal to sort of really sit with the murderous affinities and affiliations that comprise this thing called uh, somali nationalism like all other nationalisms um except within our context you know it's a nationalism that's uh, celebrated and taken and taken as you know the only the only way to enter or be in relation to Somalia is through Somali animal. So if you don't fit within that confine, then yeah, then you're outside the context of the nation. And it's like you're describing in, in a in a different, obviously different context, like what is so endemic to the entire continent, right? Is like we like to think of ourselves as you know, it's indigenous, it's the homeland, it's whatever, whatever, but it's like we haven't begun to properly contest with ethnopolitics because we're kind of existing in what Terence Ranger describes as this patriotic history. And, and when I read you describing kind of these memories and these nostalgias, it's never kind of kind of gliding over the fact that under the surface of some of these memories and nostalgia is this really kind of insidious fabrication of what it means to be self and kind of foist an other onto the other. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly like what you said, this sort of ethnopolitics of, of I mean, and for me, I'm very much concerned with the, the figure of the father um, and the figure of um, the mother as being these two poles that represent their own sort of um, contested nationalisms. Um, mm. So you have also, you know, the motherlands and fatherlands, um, but also just in terms of how that's something that I felt very viscerally in the first trip I ever took to Somalia when I was, which was actually a very formative experience, because I remember I went and that I was about like 12 years old, um, actually just about under 12 years old, and it was also, a, it was a summer, and I remember it was the first time I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, because my mom had bought it with her, with some light holiday reading um <laughs> and I remember reading that taking that from her and then just like reading it and I was in Galkaia which is my my, my dad's um, hometown and I really wanted to know like why we couldn't go to the capital city and my mother was like well actually you know that's again it's a very contested space 
you know, um, I'm from a major clan, you know, it's quite fraught out there and you're not from a, your father's not from a protected clan. You know, it's quite dangerous for you there. And I just remember being, you know, somebody who was really just um, the recipient of so much uh, nostalgia around, you know, I mean, I think with so many of these sort of post-colonial um, states of melancholia, right? There's this idea of the golden years. Everyone I speak to, um, whether they're from like Somalia or whether they're from like um, Iraq or whether they're from, I mean, you name it. It's like there's this period that's considered the golden years, um, which if you're lucky enough, your parents have experienced. Um, but if you're unlucky, and there's also the other side of it, which is you inherit that toxic nostalgia. And it's sort of like this really syrupy fog of nostalgia for those years. And I just remember, you know, being in that context and then just noticing things like, well, actually, there's these very marked roles that people who are Bantu Somalis or people who are Somalis outside of um, the main dominant um, ethnic groups, that these roles they fulfill within society, right? And they're, they're, the, the jobs they're relegated to. And just like being really immersed in that. And it's just an experience that for me, I, I've never really, in many ways, I've never recovered from it because it was, I just realized that, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't a space where you could, you could just be embraced in a way that was, I, I felt, you know, you could have that sort of returnee um, fantasy. So for me, it was very, that fantasy was shattered at a very young age. It's so interesting to contrast that with like the year of return. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, let me not. Um, yeah. And that feels related to the last line that I wrote down, which was, waited till it was safe enough to look back. They're still waiting. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder as well, because we've had some conversations before, disclaimer to everyone, um, but um, I was just wondering how that sort of fits into your own, um, your own work, this idea of nostalgia as almost genocidal impulses. Um, I mean, I think about, God, where do I start? I mean, there's the kind of personal as, you know, Zimbabwean, and then there's the kind of intellectual that I'm kind of trying to parse through as an outsider within the Namibian context. And, you know, in Zimbabwe, patriotic history revolves around Shona nationalism, right? There's the fact that when we think about the major resistance struggles of which there have been two, the first one was primarily fought and initiated by the Ndebele, and yet we call it the Chimurenga which is the Shona word for struggle, as opposed to Mvukela, which is the Ndebele word for it. And there are so many ways that in the construction of the nation state, you know, the Ndebele people have been kind of written out of history, um, you know, obviously kind of culminating in, in, in President Mugabe literally attempting to exterminate Ndebele people in the, in the 1980s during um, the Gukarahundi and you know, there hasn't, we're, we're not really supposed to talk about the Gukurahundi because, you know, Mugabe, not left office, but was removed from office, you know, a couple of years ago and passed away. And now the current president was a part of that as a part of the military apparatus. So I don't know. I'm trying to think about, you know, in me being embracing Zimbabweness, what my responsibilities are as a Shona person. Um, whether it is or how it is possible for me to be excited about Zimbabwe as a project um, when I have a politic of not being excited about any nation state. And mm -hmm. when my Zimbabweness was constructed to necessarily come at the expense of Ndebele people and other, and the Shangani people who are right now, the government is trying to push off of their land to, um, to grow feed. Um, for, for livestock. Um, and yet this is the country that was celebrated for taking land back from the whites. Um, and then of course, in the Namibian context, you know, you have this history of the Herero and Nama genocide that the Namibian government is calling the Namibian genocide because we all suffered under colonization. And yet not everybody was specifically targeted for annihilation um, by the Germans. So. Yeah, I, I don't have answers. I think I'm, 
I'm for the first time having to confront it in a way that is both kind of academic and scholarly and also deeply personal. And I'm, I'm trying to be honest, like, like you're trying, like you're being honest. Um, but you know, it's this, it, it's weird when you think about like the stakes, right? Like, I don't know if my parents were around for the golden age. I think my mom left right after independence. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I found it sort of interesting that you um, chose a poem by um, Dambudzo Maratero, um, because for me, in so many ways, he personifies this sort of idea of of the exile um, as a deeply unromantic figure. Yes. Um, and I was just wondering, yeah, wh why you chose Dambudzo other than any sort of was it for for reasons of his work or what he represents or, or really just a combination of the two? Yeah, um, I think it's a combination of the two. I think his his fiction and his poetry are both can both be incredibly like difficult to read. Um, I think he goes against so much of what we kind of think about. And I think we were just like kind of talking about exilic writing last night. Um, he's completely unromantic about the fact that he's not in Zimbabwe and he's completely, I wouldn't maybe say pessimistic, but he's just deeply cynical about what Zimbabwe will become as though he, you know, Zimbabwe got its independence late. So we saw already, you know, the revolution beginning to cannibalize her children. And he was never able to become romantic because unlike so many other people, he saw the warning signs and he refused to ignore them. And, and he had this kind of anarchic commitment to art and to truth as opposed to the nation state. And that made him incredibly dangerous. And, you know, when I think about the stories of him having these kind of tantrum like outbursts at dinner parties and like throwing plates or whatever, I think about you know, the threshold between whatever psychiatric diagnosis he might have had and the fact that knowing the truth about coloniality is just so deeply, it, it, it's so crazy making. Um, and at every turn, he refused to turn away from it. Um, he, he, he forced himself to confront it and he was a gadfly in, in Mugabe and the kind of, post-independence intelligentsia's side until he died. Um, and I don't know, I, on one hand, I'm like, I wish, sorry? So a subversion really of every sort of um, facetious characteristic of the diaspora poet in many ways, Absolutely. or diaspora poetry with, with the trademark. I, I think, <sighs> On one hand, I would love to be like, what do you, what, what does he think about this? Like, what is he, whatever. But at the same time, I'm just like, I'm glad that he's not here to see it because, mm. you know, I, yeah. Why, why subject, why subject our dead to the ways that we have kind of failed to, 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 to take up and, and run with the projects that they tried to leave for us. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something I actually think about a lot in my work. I'm mean, just the ways in which um, failure reoccurs, um, and what what is what is passed on, what is transmitted, and what fails to be transmitted, and um, and and failure is something that's actually can be quite productive in many ways, um, because there's things that I think, um, particularly within the context of Somali anymore, that it's useful that they've not been replicated or perpetuated in diaspora um, in many ways. Um, and it's useful that, you know, the ecosystem or sort of like the, the sort of ambient climate of Somalia, you know, taken outside of that context, they can no longer regenerate themselves. Um, for, for, and I think, you know, it's, I think it's just interesting because with this project, what it sort of really, what it revealed to me and clarified to me in so many ways was just this understanding of the family as a microcosm of the nation um, which isn't, I know, is not a particularly original idea, but in terms of with Somali, it's like this idea of so many people's views 
or their idea of Somali Muslim diaspora is formed in through the context of the very specific locale specific nationalisms of their parents right so it's this notion of you know you go meet somebody else and they'd be like well actually we don't eat that or we don't speak that language or like what is this you know i thought we were taught that we were a people of because with somalia there's a persistent myth of one people one language one ethnicity which is very obviously i mean it doesn't have to be said that's actually very far from the truth but everybody believes it in their own little household um including people who come from various different ethnic groups and then they come together in some spaces and they realize well actually i have no idea what's going on in the the southeast of the country or the northeast of the country or you know you were being attacked during this time and we didn't know about it you know because it was you know shut down and completely um all evidence was obliterated by the government and by um the dictatorship so it's just very interesting to see how the the the, the ecosystem of the household nurtures these contested nationalisms um which i find very very interesting because um in many ways a lot of my relationships with somalis have been through you know identifying through the the major clans uh, of my mother as opposed to the minority clan of my father and then when i actually mention where my father's from people have no idea like they're just like what is this um because he's the 0.5 in the in the 4.5 that everybody knows um but yeah i think i think in many ways i think it's it's really just the project is trying to engage with i guess i guess yeah those 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 um failures and how we can we can learn from those failures and i was wondering if that if failure is is something that obsesses you i guess same way it obsesses me yeah i mean i really love the line you wrote um debilitated us with the weight of their dreams right because failure and an embrace of failure is a rejection of that right like we're not burdened by by this nostalgia it can offer a reference point it can offer a snapshot into something that may have worked it could offer a glimpse into a set of memories or practices or whatever but accepting or or an, an embrace of failure as opposed to this debilitation is a recognition that like we don't our goal is not to replicate our goal is to is to find some sense of 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 stabilization and to replicate is to simply like disorient ourselves over and over and over again rather than recognizing what went wrong and how to do it better um but it's yeah i yeah it, it i also i think about it a lot but i'm also i also just get stuck because mm -hmm. i get frustrated because it seems like the conditions for experimentation were so much more ripe um decades ago versus as opposed to now like there's so much more we have more language we have maybe more ideas we have maybe bravery but there seems to be you know the boot is so much heavier in a way yeah i think there's yeah there's a real yes yeah, it's it's, it's I, i experience it as a sort of like theoretical stagnation but also just a I think it's just this um this moment of 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 rupture that then ripples out and then almost calcifies one in its wake right so you have this you're almost like stultified by the just the overwhelming nature of displacement at least for some months and in so many ways you know you have and and I think that what you, what you just described as stuckness would be you know growing up with people who it didn't really matter where they were raised or like the passports they carried every single person um regardless of their age had this idea of I'm going to return to Somalia um which I found really interesting I remember picking up on the idea and just thinking well actually this is very strange because everybody else I speak to seems to be quite comfortable being british but everyone here just wants to go back to Somalia um even though you know the image that you know you're fed on in, in the news and stuff like isn't a particularly pleasant one but nobody cared everyone was like i'm going to learn these skills so i can go back and they would be like 11 years old saying that so it's this complete stultification and and i think just in terms of like i think it's really hard to speak about political despair and political heartbreak it's really hard um to speak about that um and just to but it's it's hard but it's felt it's felt so so heavily um i i can just be in a room of older somali men and it just sits in the air it's so thick um mm -hmm. but it's it's i think it's also a, it's a conversation that 
one of the reasons it's so difficult to initiate is because it always requires, it has this transgenerational element to it, um, which, which can be difficult because you're unlocking memories, you're unlocking, you're unlocking people's own desires, which I think in many ways, everything I write about is about desire. It's about repressed desire. It's about anticipatory desire. It's about shared desire. You know, and, and I think, and in many ways, I think that's, it's been very difficult for me to tap into these stories because I feel like a lot of the elders in my community personally, they don't, they don't really feel as if they want to share that part of themselves because it's so beaten down. Yeah. And it represents, a, it represents their youth and it represents, I mean, that's, that's the idea of like this whole, like the nostrum that is like the um the golden years that hangs over the heads of many people who experience these th these moments of um post-colonial post-independence um rigor and 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 energy and then just lost it you know and there's real heartbreak there that i don't think like we've we've contended with as a, as a continent as, as african people yeah yeah I mean, so much of my relationship to Zimbabwe comes from, you know, the guy who taught me politics, who's like an ex gorilla And, you know, I, I sent him some, something from a book I didn't like that was talking about violence. I think it was actually, I sent him a piece of Judith Butler's book on, on nonviolence, which I didn't like mm -hmm. very much. And I was like, what do you think of using Fanon this way? And he went on a whole thing, you know, we would train, and we would read Malcolm X and Kruma and Fanon and this and this and this, and how could this happen? And how does this make sense? And there's this way that like him maintaining the same kind of ferocity, um, political ferocity, like it makes me really sad because where is the space for that? Where is the space for that kind of energy to exist outside of our conversation in the lounge? Like where, in Zimbabwean, like it's the thing where, so we've had, well, we had one president for 40 years or, or for 38 years, right? So it's like, there's no space for anything outside of opposition to that single person, which is a real stunting of political imagination for almost four decades. And mm -hmm. so when all of your energy kind of revolves around this singular person and then the singular person is gone, then what do you have? Okay, now, you know, we don't, there's this new person who was the old person's vice president. So he's basically like the old person, but it's, there still hasn't been this, this injection of, of like a politic that allows for a capaciousness of ideas and experiments outside of electoralism, outside of the nation state and, or outside of thinking about neoliberalism in the future, right? Like what of, restitutions, what of reconciliation, what of acknowledging out loud what happened in, in from like 80, 83 to 87, you know, what, where, where is this, where is this kind of like desire, I'm not going to put like the radical in front of it to like make it a modifier, but where is this real kind of radical repair um, for this whole generation of people who were traumatized by the war, who were traumatized by this genocide, um, do you think do you think that perhaps the um the re, the reverting to or sort of like the aestheticization of that those moments those moments of you know possibility political possibility um that we see just in a wider sort of dias back diasporic context you know people it, it's everywhere around us you know everybody wants to put on a beret put their fists up that kind of thing so it's like do you think that in many ways is a sublimation of the despair yeah basically people playing dress up and getting that sold back to us and commodified culturally absolutely i mean i'm i'm always so taken you know when it's like a different african independence day and i'm always so interested in the photographs that people choose in their commemorations of that independence day and it's always, you know, depending on the country, depending what the particular struggle looks like, it's like women with AKs, it's 
it's these black and these beautiful black and white images of the golden years, right? These these days of of your these 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 moments of goodness before it was ruined, um, and it's not super often that I see a photograph of the present. Um, mm -hmm. And that feels like a reason for despair, right? That, that, that the present condition is not sufficient to, to, to inspire celebration, to inspire a kind of nostalgic look back at the past 30, 40, 50, however many years there, there's been independence and really kind of sigh in a sense, with a sense of kind of pride and excitement and satisfaction. Um, there's, yeah. And, and I think also the other thing that really gets me is the ways that people praise independence parties. Um, and, you know, the ways that there's such excitement about like, these are the ones that brought us to freedom and these are the ones that da 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 da. And in a lot of the countries, you know, those are the people who are still in part in, in power because in one way or another, they've managed to eliminate their political opposition. Um, like, are we, are, are we also talking about, about that, about the kind of real time exploitation of, of, their, of their bravery, of their work admittedly, right? And the, the kind of contemporary necrotic rot that they have come to occupy in the countries. Um, so do yeah. you see a sort of space for, for culturally, the, the, work of, the work of that, as you called it, radical repair? But I think it demands an honesty, right? Like I think mm. it has to be a repair that is not driven by nostalgia. Um, it has mm. to be a repair that, you know, in, this, in the case of Somalia, that is not driven by this, we are all Somali, one nation, one language, one people, whatever, like that, that's simply not true. Um, but I don't know, I don't know what it would take for us to kind of move past this, 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 um, this excitement over seeing ourselves represented, right? Like I, I don't know what would initiate a crisis of consciousness sufficient to force us to be honest. Um, because, you know, I'm seeing, I saw a lot of folks that I knew go back to Ghana for a year of repair. And there is, depending on the group, there's not a massive overlap between the people who were observing this year of, of return, um, but also talking about what Ghana is doing to queer and trans people. Um, mm. And so is this like a diasporic effort, kind of diaspora, like, like kind of not nation specific diaspora, but who, who, who is doing that work? Or, or whose work is that to do? I guess is my question. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see what you what you're saying with this. this with the whole, the Ghana as an example is quite interesting because that's where I mean, so much culturally intersected right there with the whole politics of returnee life. Um, in terms of just you know, literally the government funding all these Afrobeat stars and you name it, you know, just essentially making it this like this this project, turning it into this project of um, touristic renewal uh, um, and and just you know essentially advertising the country's vitality and everybody come to Ghana um, which is actually quite seductive I wanted to go to Ghana I was like looking at people who also do it looks stories. wonderful I was like I want to go but okay. um but that's something that I've actually been like really ambivalent about and I think the ambivalent does pop up the ambivalence does pop up in my own work because I'm I, I I'm somebody that always wanted to sort of you know go to Africa and just and live in a particular African country or just literally just have that kind of life and I mean I was always very much aware of how um, difficult it would be to ethically be in relation to people who do not hold my passport who do not you know and I and I, I obviously detest the discourse of you know privilege checking but at the same time it's just there is this element of having to understand yourself as somebody who is so far removed from people who stayed, from people who had to stay. Um, in, in, so, in so many ways, even the, the narrative of refugeehood is very much um, bolstered by this fiction of, you know, there's this, this singular refugee story, when actually in many cases, you know, people who could afford to leave are the ones that who left. 
um, and the people who really had couldn't afford to had to stay. So um, I think that deep ambivalence is is actually complicates I think my relationship with not just not just I think um, Africa as a place or an imaginative space, but also just in terms of like poetics that um, arises or erupts from a place of like, diaspora, from a place of exile, um, <laughs> from a place of African poets who write about and on these subjects. Um, in many ways, I, I tend to, I, at one point, I was like consuming a lot of that literature because I felt like it was, in many, I felt like I was trying to learn a different way to be, to be an African outside of Africa. So I was reading a lot, you know, and as somebody who feels as if they're tied there in some sort of intimate way, and someone who feels like they, they have this pull, like they want to actually live there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's been difficult to work through that personally, but I think um, poetically, um, it's useful to sort of yeah, it's what, what you said. It's useful to 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 be as honest as possible, which isn't necessarily encouraged in within notions of you know unified community. I would love to jump in. Um, this has been so rich and fascinating. Um, I just wanted to make a little bit of room for um, some audience questions because there was right. one that, came in that directly, I believe, ties into what you were just uh, speaking to, Mamtaza. Um, so this one comes from Mariama uh, Namakanda. Uh, I love your work, both of you, and have been following you for some time now. So there's, this is a two-part question. The first asks, uh, your thoughts on recent events in Senegal, Haiti, Uganda, and Nigeria. Um, how do these events figure into your earlier conversation about nationalism and nostalgia? Do you see a diasporic solidarity resulting in real change? Um, and then part two asks, about the writing process, how do you manage your personal relationships with the subject matter that you work with? Are there certain things you don't include in your work? How do you deal with the heaviness of the subject matter? And that was posed to both of you, whoever wants to take that on first. Um, I, I'll, I'll go with, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do the first question, then I'll throw it out to you, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, regarding events um, on the continent right now, um, yeah, I mean, I just think, I've been thinking a, a lot about that, that, that refrain, you know, we can uh, chew gum and walk at the same time. And I've been starting for a long time. I've actually been quite suspicious of that refrain. I don't think people can do that. Um, I think people are showing in many ways that they cannot do that. They cannot focus on two things at once. So on one hand, you can't sort of like be obsessed with whatever dramas are going on in the English royal family. And at the same time, um, be cognizant of what's happening in the actual countries that are having to, having to essentially grapple with um, I wouldn't even call it legacies, it's living realities of neocolonialism um, that are still ongoing. Like the people in Senegal are being shot down with French weapons. Um, and these governments are propped up by European powers to this day. So, I mean, it's, I think for me, it's, it's, it's quite hard to, to sort of, it's sort of quite hard to keep track because if there's one kind of political if there's one form of political conversation that truly like deadens my spirit it's um what goes on in African politics whether it's Somalia or in general it's it's quite um it feels I think it's it's you're overwhelmed by how how much how overwhelming how overwhelming the capacity for avarice and and just pure greed that exists in terms of just this exploitative nature, the exploitative nature of the relationship the whole world has to Africa, right? It's a place of, it's, a, it's, 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 it's sort of this, this, this space where you essentially just push out all the people there and exist in this sphere that's outside of like recognition or outside of the understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to be a political subject, right? Um, and to be to be met with the weight of that every time you have a conversation about when you try to follow African politics is, you know, it feels it's it's quite full of despair. And, you know, it feels like sitting in your living room as your dad talks to his friends and you're just like, how are we going to disentangle this? You know, but I feel like in terms of acts of solidarity, um, I think educating oneself is what I try to do. And I don't mean that in the 
like horrifically anemic liberal way, but I mean it in the sense of trying to understand like why this is the way it is and how this is actually wrapped up in how in many ways the politics across the continent has reverberates and it's in, so entangled in so many ways. Um, and also just trying to understand where we can apply pressure as Africans who are in these positions in diaspora, right? Um, and also just trying to revert. And I think for me, for me, it's always this act of emotional fortitude. It's always this act of, I see my empathy as a reservoir. And I truly believe, as I said at the beginning, you know, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. I have to redirect my energy elsewhere. So all this fluff, all this sort of like representational hall of mirrors or whatever, you know, none of that really matters. Like I try to focus on what I can actually, what my empathy and energy should be focused on. Like this is what deserves it. Um, because in many ways, the condition of people in Africa is, is mirrored by what happens to Africanized people or people of African descent across the world, right? And I know that's not a point that, you know, many people have brought that up. You know, Malcolm X was somebody who was very much a proponent of that. So I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to see how I can fit in into the, into the wider picture of uplifting, um, uplifting the people's political struggles there and supporting them with everything, everything I really, everything I can do um, to the best of my capacity, I guess. Yeah, um, I think I feel pretty similarly. I think that a lot of my way of understanding the continent and the world has just been really understanding, um, obviously the United States is not exceptional, but understanding the kind of far reachingness of the tendrils of American imperialism. Um, that's not to let France and England and Germany and everyone else off the hook, but it's like, I pay taxes in this country. And I, I think that when we have conversations about taxes, we often think about, you know, the funding of the Israeli occupation, which yes, absolutely. But, and also, you know, AFRICOM and the expansion of AFRICOM, um, the, 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 fabri the fabrication of these kind of war on terror defense sites on the continent um, has been a really invaluable part of, of understanding um, the continent as a diasporan. Um, and, and yeah, I think diaspora solidarity is good and useful. And I, and I also think that people on the continent are a lot smarter than us in terms of having a very good and clear understanding of what it is that they're experiencing and what it is that they need. Um, and I think that it isn't enough to just like learn about the things, but to actually like have interactions with people who are on the continent and engaged in these struggles or in Haiti um, and, and, you know, in the, in the Caribbean who are engaging in these struggles and, and to, you know, to do the kind of transnational dialoguing. And when I was talking about, there was a time when it seemed like this kind of transnationalism was so much more accessible and, and there was so, it was so fertile um, to see how, you know, not to be nostalgic, but to see how we can, with the technologies that we have, um, despite the surveillance, right? Like how we can renew and, and like re-strengthen these relationships with folks as, as diasporans. Um, so that feels really important to me. Great. Yeah, thank you both so much. And um, unfortunately, I feel like we are um, about out of time. So I was just curious if either of you had any kind of like last remarks you wanted to share, ask one another before we wrap up. I can't think of anything, but it's really nice to see you and really nice to talk to you. And I'm glad that we got to do this today. Same, same. And I, I love, by the way, the Lucille Clifton poem that you chose. I just started like really, really the reading her one. as much as I should. And um, that one is one of my favorites. Great, thank you both. And um, yeah, just as a reminder to the audience, um, Jennifer Soong and Denise Riley will be appearing next Saturday at 12, um, uh, emceed by Brandon Brown. And yeah, I just wanna thank you both again on behalf of myself and the, the Poetry Center and Archives. It was really amazing to hear your work and your thoughts. Um, yeah, thank you so much.